Okay, well, thanks very much for that kind introduction, Alan. I, I've had uh, quite, a, quite a busy past six months and I'm delighted that we're all able to uh, meet again virtually to uh, get the Microscope Club online uh, going uh, again. Uh, I'm expecting this year to have to spend a lot more time doing spiders uh, for personal reasons. I won't be able to go out as much at, at night as I used to be able to. So, um, uh, Alan, I'll be calling on you to help me with the spiders. I'm, <laughs> uh, because um, I'm all set up with my vacuum sampler and everything. So hoping this is going to be quite a good year for that. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I've been amazed and really pleased as well at how quickly I've been able to get some other speakers other than just me uh, for the Microscope Club. Uh, Pete, as we said, will be share, sharing his experiences of uh, getting to grips with the uh, moth dissection. Uh, but I did want to just mention about the, uh, uh, the mites, uh, because um, we're actually going to be encouraged to bring our own mites along to the, uh, the, the, the meeting as well. I had a long chat with Matthew, who's wonderfully <laughs> enthusiastic. And he will be producing a very short little video of how to collect some mites. And hopefully online, we'll be able to work through his key and he will um, help uh, demonstrate how to use the key he's written to identify some mites. At least one person will be bringing them along. So uh, I shall definitely bring some mites. But anyway, there will be a bit more information about that. Well, on, on to this evening's um, meeting. Um, yes, we're a microscope club. And yes, everybody knows that you can identify moths with by, by doing dissections. But one of the things that's been increasingly fascinating me, and this has sprung up partly looking at spiders as well, is the number of external features that you can use for helping to identify moths. Now, many of the other wildlife groups, um, you'll see people using a hand lens. I always use a hand lens on macro moths anyway. Um, but one of the surprising things is that there are this, there's a whole array of features that can help give you a um, good safe ID. And what I'll talk about this evening are, are two little moths. I've got them here nicely um, uh, uh, pinned up. And talk about the story of how I um, actually uh, got uh, um, what, what amounted to quite a surprising identification. Now, because I like to flip through different technology, and I've already proved myself this evening that you can't run Windows and Zoom on a Mac at the same time. Fortunately, I, uh, I, I recorded my talk and I'm going to play uh, a video of that um, uh, talk to you and then we we'll have um, come back to an interactive session at the end so it's a little bit of a sandwich really a uh, live session now uh, a recorded presentation and then uh, live session at the end it's not a terribly long uh, video it's uh, a little less than 10 minutes long um, uh, so I don't know how long we'll go on chatting for afterwards but anyway I'm going to share my screen and a fine player, uh, which is this one. And then hopefully you will be able to hear my presentation. Oh, and I have a very unfortunate expression on my face at the start of the video. I'm not that good at video editing. So, whoops. Oh, here it is. <laughs> And hopefully you can you can One see that thumbs up about looking at moths on the yeah we can see it is the number of external features that there are that can be used to assist in identification without the need to do any dissection. Uh, a particular example, of um, Paul, today. just pause that a second. Yeah, um, you're you're doing a ventriloquist act. We can hear you talking on the video, but your lips aren't moving. The video is frozen. Have you got the video open in more than one window? No, I don't think so. OK, because the video is frozen. It's not moving. Uh, uh, but we could hear the soundtrack. 
Okay, what we're going to do then, what we're going to do, we're going to stop that. And we go over to, oh, we click, get, get out of that. Just as well one of us knows what we're doing, isn't it? Is that uh, Pete? No, no, that's you. <laughs> that's you. Right, go to Mr. YouTube. And your videos. We, we can edit this bit out and pretend that we all know what we're doing. Yeah, I know you can. Right. Well, okay, let's try doing it this way. So I'm going to go back to my share it again. So imagine what this would have been like if I'd have tried it with all sorts of technology. When, when you when, when you when you play it on YouTube, Paul, you might want to maximize the screen so it's I'll, full I'll, screen. I'll do that. Yeah. Right. The things about looking at moths under the microscope is the number of external features that there are that can be used to assist in identification. Uh, can't see the video, Paul, I'm afraid. So you're, you're muted now, Paul. How did we do this before then? It worked perfectly before, didn't it? Um, yeah, it's, um, uh, I, 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 I've I've got Paul Palmer started screen sharing, but I'm I'm just got a black window. I don't know if everyone else has got the black window as well. Yeah, same um, here. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not seeing any video. We're not seeing a YouTube window. Gosh. It looks as if it's still trying to load, though. Okay. Can you see? Um, can you see my desktop now? Just got a black window saying that you've started screen sharing. Uh, try try quitting your browser and starting your browser again. Going to YouTube. Mm -hmm. I can see it perfectly. <laughs> I don't I don't know what you were sharing, but we 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 couldn't see any YouTube. No, that's all right. So. <laughs> okay. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Google Chrome rather than Safari. Um, I've got Chrome around here somewhere. Um, right here it is, Google Chrome. Uh, of course, now it asks me to sign in. Right. One of the interesting things about looking at... Right, okay. Number of times I've heard that. Right, let me try a game using Google Chrome. Right, okay, can now, now we can see YouTube. Yeah, that's ah, it. there we go. Moths under the microscope is the number of external features that there are. Um, I think the sound has gone again, Paul. We got the first sentence and then it went Absolutely. muted and uh -huh. then it went quiet. Uh -huh.
I it's, think it's when he puts himself on mute. It, it's coming and going. Yeah, leave is it leave leave your microphone open, Paul. Can you unmute your microphone, Paul? The specimen and it proved quite challenging. That works, identify. does it? Okay, so 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 that so that works. When 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 your microphone is open, we can hear YouTube. So if you start if you just start from the beginning of the video now. Gosh. Proves how much you forget when you have a holiday, isn't it? <laughs> Things about looking at moths under the microscope is the number of external features that there are that can be used to assist in identification without the need to do any dissection. Uh, a particular example of this I'm going to talk about today is a moth that I took just checking the date here in on the 16th of August at Rutland Water at Sugar. And uh, I quite like sugaring as some of you already know. And this particular moth looked for all the world like a snout, but didn't look quite right. And then it folded its wings above its back um, in a very unsnout like pos posture. So I took the specimen and it proved quite challenging to identify, but the external features really made a difference. So I'm going to talk you through what I found. The moth in question was taken at Rutland Water on the 16th of August 2020 at Sugar. It looks all the world like a very battered snout moth that has lost its snout. It's the same size, it's the same shape, um, but it briefly put its wings above its head in a very unsnout like posture. Uh, so I took the moth for further examination. If we have a look at a set specimen of the snout moth, we can see the similarities to our unknown moth. The main difference being, of course, the very prominent snout on the snout formed by the forward facing palps. The wing shape and size is very similar and there's outlines of very similar wing markings as well. But if we were to go and have a look, as we will do in a moment, at the microscopic features, we can see further differences. If we take a close look at the head of the unknown moth, we can see that there's a coiled proboscis, which is not surprising since we took the moth at sugar, and this is the organ the moth uses to feed. There's a pair of short forward facing palps, which are clearly unbroken, and a very large compound eye. If we look more closely at the compound eye and the surrounding area, we can see that there's no evidence of a single simple eye. Okay, so looking at the snout, we can see that the, uh, the face is very different indeed. The proportion of the uh, compound eye is much smaller and appears less bulbous. And in the 12 o'clock position above the eye, you can see a little round dot, and that is a simple eye. Now, we now really do have confirmation that what we're looking at is a different species rather than a very battered snout moth. So how do we go and get an identification? What we need to help us is a key to the families and subfamilies of the Lepidoptera. Fortunately, there is a key available. It's aimed at Canadian species, but it's freely downloadable if you do a search on this. And there's also an electronic version of this key available as well that runs on Windows computers. The uh, software version of the Canadian key is well organized and easy to use. When you hover the mouse over various elements, you see pictures and descriptions of what the options are. And these are very easy to select. So what I'm gonna do here is select all the things that I know about the um, moth in question. 
And as we go through, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see the number of families and subfamilies change as you select items. So the number of possibilities are reduced. The huge disadvantage of this type of key is that as you're working through, you don't really know what the important features are. So a really well organized text-based dichotomous key will lead you through the important items uh, in priority order. Um, and this is very useful because the expertise of the author has gone in to making the key. But here, it really is just a, a matter of entering the things that you can see. I will say this for this key though, an enormous amount of work has gone into it and it is beautifully illustrated. So it is a really, really good example of uh, external features of MOS and will certainly help you learn more about them. As we work through the key, so we get down to a realistic number of possibilities. And what I'm particularly interested in here is that the geometer moths are clearly uh, a very strong possibility. And in particular, the Larinidae are also a very important subset. And these are the carpets moths and their allies. Using the key, using the combination of the palps, lack of a simple eye, the length uh, of the antenna and the fact that they're not heavily feathered, it becomes very obvious that what we're looking at is a geometer moth, probably of the family Larentiniae. I find it better to concentrate on the size and shape of the moth when presented with an unknown specimen, rather than getting too bogged down in the patterns on the wings, because these can sometimes be misleading if the specimen isn't typical. In this case, we're looking at a geometer moth, probably one of the carpets or its allies. And if we look through all the, um, the moths that are of a similar size and shape, and fly at this time of year, we find that there's really only one likely specimen, and that is the shaded brawl bar. So to be sure of our identification, we need to do a dissection. And sure enough, the dissection confirms shaded brawl bar as an ID for this moth. It's worth noting that the snout is listed as a confusion species for the shaded world bar. And in the end, I was able to find a very pale specimen, very similar to this one, uh, on a German website as well. I've always been really keen on using hand lenses when identifying all moths, including macro moths. And I hope you found this interesting in finding out how there are many more external features that can be used for identification of moths other than just the, uh, the patterning on the wings. In fact, being honest with you, every time I've made a mistake in identifying a moth, it's because I've looked at the pattern of the wings rather than paid attention to the shape of the moth and its size and other things like the time of year it is flying at. So anyway, Good luck with your mothing. Well, I have to say, watching that, I realised just how incredibly tired I was when uh, making that uh, video. And also the lockdown hair, which I know many of us were um, uh, suffering uh, from. Um, I'm going to spare some other people's blushes, but I had shown that moth to a couple of other people and nobody was able to identify it. And everybody was surprised it was a, was a shaded broad bar uh, as well. And as I, I mentioned, in the end, on a German website, I, I found a, um, a specimen that looked incredibly similar uh, to, to the one that I um, uh, took. 
And, and since then, I've been paying a lot more attention to the external features, especially the faces on the, uh, the moths as well, because I'm starting to find, as I'm giving specimens for um, uh, dissection, and usually they have a little note saying what people think they are, it's surprising how often when I've had a little peek at their faces, I can think, hmm, it's not that family. It's, it's definitely um, something else. So pugs, you know, might actually be really um, some crambid moths. Yeah, it's, it really is surprising. I did say the video wasn't very long, but if anybody's got any uh, questions, I'd be happy to um, uh, have a go and answer them or we can uh, discuss generally. I've also got the, uh, the moth in question um, under the microscope here. And theoretically, I should be able to share the picture of that as well. Thanks, Paul. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to pick anything up from that. I mean, it was it was very obvious when you when you showed the close up of the head uh, um, that, you know, you, you could see the obvious differences in, in the pulps and the eyes. Uh, I must admit, when I'm trying to identify things, which I do very badly, um, I don't um, I, I don't tend to go much beyond the, the hand lens uh, part. And, and I think those details that you were showing are not immediately obvious with a hand lens. Or, or I suppose they are if you know exactly what you're looking for, uh, in which case you can probably guess the ID anyway. Um, yeah, that's that. That's right. There's there's as far as I can see, it's um, an overlooked feature on macro moths. If you have a look at say the micro moth, um, it's spinning round here and right at the start of. Um, the book on micro moths, you know, there's, there's a picture of the faces of various families, but we actually lack that um, easily available information for the macro moths as, um, as well. And uh, starting to dissect pugs, I noticed quite a lot of those uh, have some very distinctive facial features. Um, and I've wondered whether they are reliable enough uh, as an alternative to having to do the dissection because dissecting is actually time consuming and fiddly and you know it's, it's, it's great fun but the external features are, are just there to be seen. It would be very useful if there were better tools for pugs. I mean speaking as someone who struggles enormously with pugs. Well, everybody does. <laughs> Yeah, but you know that if if you could you know use use a hand lens or even or even just a stereo mic to look at the head, uh, that would be great. Uh, yes, that, that's right. There's these little organs. I think I've got the pronunciation right. The chetisomata, I think, is what it is, and they're like little hairs on the head. And I noticed in the pugs, some of them it's like a hair band all the way across. Others have just got some tiny little fingers. Others, they're great big, long, like little things either side the head. And so far, I've not found any book mentioning those as a, as a diagnostic feature. It, this is very much starting to sound like your next PhD. <laughs> book maybe, but not, a, not, a, not another PhD. <laughs> that was why I was so tired when I was doing the video. <laughs> there's no there's no limit to the number of phds you can hold you know you can have as many as you want i know and i know it gets back onto the moth thing i know there's an element of here you know you, you need a microscope to see the features and i wasn't aware of them until i had the microscope now i've got the microscope i'm looking for them and I have to say that's another one of the reasons why I want the other stand to work with the microscope so I can look more easily at the specimens that I have because I've got uh, 40 years worth of specimens. You always have a risk when you move them. Um, so being able to see them in situ in their case uh, would be, be very useful just to see what these, um, what these features are. But um, I, I am inclined to think 
both from my growing experience and looking at um, this particular key, that there, there, there is something here and that there, there is something worth um, looking at. So certainly at the moment, all the specimens being passed to me for dissection, I'm trying to take really, really good quality stack photo, uh, focus photographs of the um, of the face uh, um, to see, uh, and, and other parts of the body appear to have de definitive features, uh, just to just to, to see if I can um, put something together uh, there. But so I mean, if, you, if you're looking for a project, I can send you a list of species that I'd like you to do. Uh, I mean, you could do coppers, for example, and Svensons. There was that story going around about Svensons that the pulps were significant, which I think has now been discounted. Oh, I discounted that within 20 minutes of hearing about it, <laughs> because I, I had this is one of the advantages of, of having physical specimens. I was able to have a look at some of the specimens I have from over the years and uh, within a few minutes uh, find that um, the, the story about the pulps just didn't hold uh, with the few that, that, that I had. Um, conversely, you, you, you mentioned Sevensons. Um, I found that if you hold a Sevensons at the, just the right angle in really good light and use a three times hand lens, you can look at the space between the body and the hind wing and you can actually see the extent of the copper scales. You need a hand lens because there's orange scales there and coppery scales. And without the hand lens, you can't distinguish between the two, but with the hand lens, you can see the difference. And so um, you can't do it on a warm specimen, but a reasonably good specimen, you can get them every time. Um, but yeah, you get the angles absolutely right or quick whiff of carbon dioxide, quick peek and <laughs> let them recover. So, so for anyone who's not, not familiar with what we're talking about, we're talking about the copper underwings, mm. two species of copper underwing, which are, which are a bit difficult to uh, tell apart. Uh, I think, I mean, that's an example, I believe I'm right in saying where even dissection doesn't help that much. They're pretty, dis the gendets are pretty similar as well, aren't they? I can't remember. On I think they're one. quite similar. Uh, so, the, so the other thing I did on this topic was my, my ongoing quest to be able to do uncertain and rustic reliably. Um, I spent quite a long time looking at the wings, the scale structure on the wings of those. Um, uh, but, you know, this business of, uh, which, remind me which way around it is, one's supposed to have a silky appearance and the other one's supposed to be rougher. I, can't, I can never remember which way around it's supposed to be. I have to look it up every year. Um, but um, I, I initially convinced myself that I could I could tell them apart by looking at the scales under a uh, uh, under a stereo microscope, uh, and and then uh, after a few weeks I managed to unconvince myself that that was the case it just wasn't reliable enough. Uh, uh, yeah, again, when we, we did that, um, I did that presentation on on separating the mm -hmm. the two. But I have to say. My favorite method with those when I'm not sure is to hold a straight edge like a ruler uh, or a pencil against the edge of the um, the wing because on the uncertain, the uncertain always has a slightly, I'm exaggerating, a bowed costa and the rustic, it's always straight. It's quite subtle, but if you hold a straight edge, the human eye is very sensitive to that shape. And then you can start to pull in all the um, the other features as well. You see, spiders are much much easier than this. You you just you just count the number of spines on the legs and you look at the position of the uh, sensory hairs, and you're away. You know, if you, if you could do if you could do um, uh, uncertain and rustic by counting the the hairs on the on the face, that would be great. That would be really good. I think it'd be fun to just to have a look to see if there's uh, some differences on the uh, uh, the face. Some of the cram bits are, uh, uh, yes. Uh, oh, oh, uh, oh, Elizabeth and Ethel, we did this. We've got some pictures you can share. Do you want to try sharing some mm. pictures there? Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, go, go ahead. Can you give them permission to share? They, they should be able to share, yeah. If you, if you open your pictures first in, in whatever you view your pictures in and then share that window, I don't know if you're on an iPad, uh, Elspeth. No. Okay, because it's tricky on an iPad. Okay, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, this, we just had. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 We tried just doing rather crudely, and I hope you got it. <laughs> you can tell us now whether we got it right or not. Um, literally, just took some photos and then did some lines. So we thought we got our eye in to the literally the straightness of the full wing so the straight bit on the uncertain we thought was roughly 35 to 40 percent of the total wing length mm -hmm. and then the rustic the really straight bit ended up being about 65 so yeah i don't know you got pictures of them yeah mm -hmm. um it seemed to work for us um you're now going to tell me that that rustic's uncertain and the <laughs> No, no, I, I think you've got it right. Um, I, 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 I'd never thought of doing it as a sort of percentage like that. I always hold the line on the just the outside edge, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. When you're, you, yeah, you used to have, oh, I used to have to do some metal work, and you hold the the square against it. You're, you're looking for the lack of light or light shining, shining through. I think they're lovely um, uh, diagrams. And then once you get your eye in, it's it, you know the the bit they talk about on texture, you, you you can start to see the texture on the moths as well. I also think in, I can never remember which way round it is, but in a moth trap, um, yeah, I think usually I find the uncertains roosting it near the top and the rustics are underneath. So the first ones you identify generally are the uncertains and then you come to a load of um, <laughs> rustics. <laughs> Um, so there may be some slight behavioural differences um, there as well. And I, I've got an idea that the same happens with the uh, copper underwings as well. There's some slight behavioural differences. But yeah, I've never tried to formalise that. Well, one of the other nice things appearing under the, the microscope with the, um, the set specimens as, as well, it's hard to do with the live. You can easily tell the, um, the gender. Um, by the little spine that collects the wings because the males have one and the females have two um, so uh, that they can be easily seen um, uh, too although um, I've noticed that with specimens that aren't set it can be ever so difficult to spot those sorts of features. So that, that's one thing that you can do with um, pugs, certainly the males, uh, the genital plates are, are quite good. Sometimes you need a little paintbrush to brush a few scales off at the tip of the abdomen. And then if you, if you take a ventral view of the tip of the abdomen, um, the, the, the genital plates are, are often will, will, will give you well, a pretty good idea to species, if not absolute. Yeah, I, I have trouble making that. Uh, work for me. The other thing is that when you depends do, on the species. Yeah, yeah. When you do the wet dissection, that little plate is so transparent; it's ever so easy to lose. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah. I, I have I have on occasion brushed them with a paintbrush to get some of the the loose scales and the overlapping scales off, and and and, and lost the whole plate. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it, it's quite quite a fiddly thing to um to, to do um has, has, it, has everybody started running their moth traps in their garden yet i know Un Pete and it has <laughs> unsuccessfully i've only i've only seen two moths this this so far for the year and you know what they are paul <laughs> <laughs> they're two yeah. good ones but yeah, yeah. Not in the trap yeah uh, very challenging well, I, I've had a couple of micros and a, um, I forget, a Hebrew character. So I've had a, a dark chestnut and a common chestnut as well. So I think I'm up to five species at the, um, at, at the moment. Pete, um, Pete's been turning up some nice moths, so um, up in the Vale of Beaver. Um, 
Yeah, I keep trying to encourage people to go out of their garden because I think gardens are a bit of a dead end at this time of year and they can be really soul destroying when you're so desperate for things to start in spring and it seems to take so long for things to really get going. But then you go into some woodland in January or February and you'll catch quite a lot of moths. So uh, I tend not to bother with my garden much uh, at this time just because I know I'll be disappointed. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I have had, I've had a couple of really good sessions in good woodland, um, you know, with uh, with two or three traps and catching, you know, three figures of moths. So it's, it's the diversity is not brilliant, but you know, the numbers you'll catch will be good. Yeah. I'm, I'm disappointed that I haven't even managed to find a light brown apple moth in my garden yet. Normally <laughs> Jan January or February is good for a light brown apple moth, but nothing so far. Yes, it's, uh, that's something that surprised um, uh, me as as well. No, uh, no, no, no sign of those at the moment. Having the benefit of a, a back garden that backs into a small bit of woodland, um, I suppose I ought to count myself quite lucky that I got 15 moths of nine species uh, at the tail end of last month. Wow, uh, that, 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 is that was quite nice. That's good going. Hmm. Uh, uh, I, I did kind of expect this evening to be a, um, a, a fairly short introductory chat after such a, a long period of um, <laughs> having my attention focused elsewhere. And as I said, when I looked at myself in that video, I thought, truth, I hadn't realised how tired I'd actually got uh, as well. I'm feeling um, a, a lot more energetic now. Uh, but some feedback that uh, you guys could uh, give me, this is the, the audience generally, is what sort of topics would you like uh, Microscope Club Online to, to cover in future? So we've got a couple of um, uh, you know, topics sorted out. I do hope we will be able to do some real face-to-face -face meetings as well, but I suspect we'll keep the online format going as a regular thing for a um, long time, as long as people are interested. We, 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 I mean, we, the other thing we could do, Paul, is uh, encourage for these, even for these online meetings, for people to uh, be able to share uh, photographs and things they'd like to talk about. I mean, certainly when, when we met face to face, we used to encourage people to bring specimens along. Mm. And I think we, we could do that. I mean, ne next month might be, might be I mean, if, I suppose if people have done dissections that they want people to look at, uh, we, we could certainly do that. I don't think anybody's going to be dissecting live on Zoom, but um, uh, if you've got photographs of, 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 well, uh, of preps that you've made, uh, it's something that we could discuss. Uh, yes, at the physical meetings, we had great fun working through <laughs> what the sections <laughs> actually uh, uh, were. Um, I, 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 I won't get on and, and ruin the topic of um, uh, next month, but uh, I mean, I, I've been taking an awful lot of photos of the sections and by next month, no doubt I'll be in full swing preparing um, even more as well. Um, I have actually been trying to figure out how to take a uh, recording of doing a dissection because one of the things that um, we found at the uh, at, you know, the physical meetings was teaching people how to do it. And a lot of it is just seeing how the actions um, uh, work. And trust me, I mean, it is, it's surprisingly straightforward once you, you've seen it in action. And I've, I've now got a couple of bad videos. I think I'll end up with some nicer ones that I can show it at some point. Um, but please, anybody, have, has anybody got any ideas as to topics? Oh, uh, have I missed a session on photo stacking? I did a simple one a long time ago, but I could do another one um, on uh, that. Uh, Hello. Welcome to a review of the microscope lab uh, Sorry, I'm I'm trying to find the link for um, for Margaret for the the one we did about uh, photo stacking.
Yes, on my, my own kit, I, I've now invested in a, a little servo motor that actually drives the, uh, the microscope. And uh, that, that's been absolutely amazing uh, because it's just enabled me to do things like go and make a cup of tea while the stack is uh, being taken um, and doing a lot on uh, batch processing as well. But I don't know how, if, if that's going too technical um, for, for people. Uh, the other thing I have found as well is that a good quality stacked photograph is actually more useful than looking through the microscope. So I'm going more to using the microscope to see what I want to take a photograph. And then I uh, take the stack photograph and I actually use that in the ID process. Um, we, I mean, we sorry, certainly Paul, could. We, um, uh, sorry, sorry, Tim, go on. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to ask which uh, photo stacking software do you tend to use, Paul? Um, I'm using uh, Helicon Focus Pro because okay. that runs beautifully on a Mac and it's really, really fast as, uh, as well. Uh, one of the things that, um, I've heard people say as well is, oh, seems to run fast on your, your computer. Uh, and I, uh, what I've observed is that the better qu the, the quality of the shots you're starting with, the faster the software runs. So I think it's a bit like if you take poor quality photographs, the um, stacking software tries to do a really good job of getting the best it can. But if you use really, really good quality photographs at the start, it really whizzes through. Um, uh, I don't routinely do it, but I've taken stacks of over 200 photos now. But I find the optimum number is usually somewhere between 20 and 60. So most of my stacks are around um, like that. And then I collect all my stacks up and then I batch process using Helicon Focus, which might take 10 minutes, you know, but, but I can go and do something useful while, while that's um, happening. Have you got some experience yourself, Tim? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've used um, both Zareen and Helicon them with hairs sometimes. So it's just really difficult to get a shot where the hair is actually lined straight. And again, perhaps it's down to the quality of the initial photographs. But yeah, it's I, I tend really with a lot of the macro stuff I do to use just a, a, a longer exposure and just get a better depth of field to begin with, I think, and just reduce the, the need for stacking just to simplify the process, really, to be honest. Yeah, uh, I, I would say it took me... Uh, it's, I, I've had the software for a couple of years, um, but over the past few months, um, I think I've taken something like um, <coughs> nearly 800 stacks. And uh, um, you, you've, uh, I'm, I'm now at the point of working out um, nuances in the microscope it, it, it itself, um, how, how that affects the quality of the image. Um, but, but I will say to anybody who's starting to look at this, it is a highly technical area and you really mustn't be afraid of getting in and trying to figure out what all the variables are to get really good quality. But if you faff around, you can get um, uh, better and better quality. So I'm taking photographs, I can share one if you like, uh, of things uh, where you know the moth eye is only half a millimeter across, and getting some really nice, um, nice results. The, um, talking about hairs, Tim. I mean, if you read the all of the mm -hmm. manuals for the stacking software, um, very often they will talk about this process of substacking for hairs. Because I think the problem with hairs and spines is a very, very slight change in the perspective yeah, of the so, angle so will, will fuzz it out. Yeah. So you so you substack small batches where you'll get effectively the same yeah, perspective. That's what I'm finding. And then assemble the substacks. Yeah. 
So comment from Margaret, she says she doesn't have Got a Mac. Got groups of um, five or ten. Yeah, that's right. Comment from Margaret, she says she doesn't have a Mac. You don't, you don't need a Mac. Both, both software, both, both Helicon and um, Serene will work on Windows or on uh, uh, Macintosh. Um, uh, I, I use Serene on a Macintosh. Helicon is faster, but they both, they both work. Um, it's just a question of what you get used to, I think. Um, so it's 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 worth looking at, but it's it's starting to get a bit a bit deep and a bit narrow. I, I suppose it is technically microscopy, uh, but um, it, it, it's it's getting a bit deep now, really. <laughs> uh, yes, it, indeed. Uh, just going to uh, just share before we we wrap up one of my uh, photos. I'm just loading my copy of Lightroom at the moment and just see where I am. Um... Well, that'll slow everything down. <laughs> oh, no, it won't. It's Lightroom. Oh, I love Lightroom, actually. Just while Paul's doing that, Alan, just uh, just coming back to photo stacking, I was actually, uh, to most of you here, the name won't mean anything, I suspect, Richard Gallon, but Alan will know Richard. Um, who produces a newsletter of the British Arachnological Society. And we're having some conversations about photo stacking. He has used both, but specifically in relation to hairs, he said that Zareen is far superior. That's, and actually yeah. to the point now that he, he doesn't touch Helicon Focus. He does all of his stacking um, using Zareen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my question was specifically, I suppose, aimed at spiders, photographing spiders, and and I've noticed a similar thing in the past that Zareen has always outperformed Helicon when it comes to handling the hairs. And I've tried, you know, small smaller batches, and it's not made any difference for me with Helicon. But again, maybe it's just, you know, like Paul says, just perseverance and and just well, once get, you get you know, down learning to... different techniques within the program perhaps once you get down to something linear like uh, a hair or a spine the the the, the setup of the microscope the precise orientation i think makes a lot of difference if your microscope tend if the image tends to track as you focus um you know that does tend to fuzz things out a bit and and make it a lot harder for the software um yeah yeah uh if you can you see that photo we can yeah now this this is um th this is one of the uh, little micros it was the uh, delias you know the uh, the little longhorn moth that lost its horn um very challenging to photo be photograph because it varies from jet black to highly reflective but in the middle of the screen there's a softening of um the uh, contrast. And I think I've now tracked that down. You can see I'm using a ring light to uh, um, uh, illuminate the subject. And I think there's a little bit of light going horizontally into the lens. So I think I need to make a, a little light lens hood to stop that, but it's only visible at the uh, highest magnification. So the eye on that moth is about half a millimeter um, uh, 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 across. I've also been taking, oh, that was a dissection I, I did for you, Alan, and I've also been taking some um, photos of spiders as, um, as, as well. And again, I'm just struggling at the moment, just improving the um, resolution. So, 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 so the moth, the, the micro that you just showed, Paul, that was presumably a dry specimen. Uh, yeah, that's and, a, a and, guy. And, and, the, and the spiders, they're, they're in alcohol? Uh, yes, the spiders were in, uh, in, in alcohol, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I get much better quality images from uh, spiders uh, in, where, where, where they're in, uh, in, in an evacuated glass block submerged in alcohol than I do for dry specimens. I think with dry specimens that the lighting is so much uh, more tricky and critical. Mm -hmm. um, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say to everyone, I'll say this to Tim as well, 
um, if, if you're struggling with resolving any particular feature, it's worth spending quite a long time playing around with lighting, different lighting sources, different diffusion, different intensities of lighting. Um, you'll, you'll get more bang for your book back from lighting than you will on buying a more expensive microscope. Uh, I totally agree with everything Alan has said. And one of the things I've just bought are things like this, uh, some extra little diffusers, different sorts of um, plastic used in light filters. You can buy it laser cut. And on some of the um, permanent slide mounts, I find you get good results if you place one of these underneath the slide for diffusing the light. So um, it's, it's all about the, the lighting. So um, yeah, spend an enormous amount of time figuring out what the best uh, sort of lighting is. But some specimens, as I say, when they're highly reflective and yet black, they're an absolute nightmare anyway. But it's, it's very good fun trying to figure it out. Bit, bit beetles are the worst because they're so shiny. Uh, yeah, but Graham Finch takes wonderful photos. He does, yeah. yeah. Um, of them. But it all comes down to messing around with lighting. I mean, I've used um, uh, tissues as well over the the lenses. So, so, so I know that Graham uses, Graham's light source is one of these dome lights. I don't know if anyone's familiar. They're, 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 they're um, a dome which is white inside and it's a LED ring light but rather than facing down towards the specimen as LED ring lights do, the, the dome light, uh, the, the LED shines up. So it comes off the dome and it literally comes from uh, 180 degrees all the way around a hemisphere. Um, and it produces fantastic results, particularly on shiny specimens. Um, the, the downside is the dome is about three or so, three or four inches uh, in diameter. The dome has to be quite big to give you the diffusion that you need. And the problem then it means you can't get at your specimen because the working distance of the lens to the specimen means that it's filled with a dome. So you have to basically set it up and, and, and then you can't do much with it. It's a bit of, they're a bit of a pain, but it, they are the best light sources bar none. Um, but, but, but it does, there, there are downsides in that you can't get at the specimen. So yeah, this is one of the things it would be fun in physical meetings for people to show what bits we're, we're using and, and actually to um, to try it out as well. I maybe, find, maybe we should have maybe we'd have, we should have a session on lighting. I think that maybe be that's quite, a topic. Yeah, I think that's um, I don't know show, it, show us your lighting rig. <laughs> Could I just ask a question there, uh, Alan? You were talking sure. about when you were doing the stacking, the fact that the uh, process is all dependent on the, the various aspects of light, as you've just been discussing. To what extent is the the uh, the distance, the algorithm of the distance between each take? Can you have it? Is it a linear process that you need to produce, or can it be non-linear in the in the zone where you're wanting more resolution of the image? You take stack, you're stacking the images more closely together. Yeah. You know, is, there, is there any relationship there? I, I, I see what you mean. I, I mean, depending on the optics of your of your setup, um, you will have a, a depth of uh, a depth of field uh, mm. for from the objective. Um, and as long as the distance uh, between uh, shots doesn't exceed the depth of field, then, then it's fine. I don't mm -hmm. think there's any advantage in having um, uh, a, a, a much less than the depth of field or significantly less. Well, ideally what you want is, so each, each depth of field, because, because within microscopy, the depth of field is very, very limited because of the magnification. So they're very thin optical slices through the specimen. And I suppose what, you, what you're wanting to do is, is, is have each of those depth of fields for each photo in the stack overlapping quite significantly. Uh, but I was, I was gonna say this earlier and I decided it was far too nerdy and off topic to say, but I'm gonna say it now anyway. The, the, there's two types of stacking. Um, there's, 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 um, uh, the, there's Z-axis stacking, focus stacking, but, but there's also median stacking. Uh, and median stacking is something that astrophotographers do a lot. Um, and it's uh, basically you repeat the same image and then do a different type of focus stack. 
Um, and, and it's a noise reduction technique, which is a problem in astrophotography because of the long uh, exposure times. Now, noise can be a problem in microscopy as well, because you, your lighting inevitably will be somewhat restricted. Um, so there, there might be some benefit in making sort of median stack sub stacks and then stacking those. Um, I, I've, I've been doing a bit of this recently with a mobile phone, not, not for microscopy, just for taking other images. And, and it works. But I mean, it, it, it's adding to your workload. Mm -hmm. So from, from the ID point of view, if, if you can get a result that's good enough, that shows the key anatomical features that you need for the identification, um, unless you're actually into the art of the process, uh, uh you, you you might decide that you don't don't want to go any further down that road you probably spend enough time sitting in front of the microscope as it is mm. and you might not want to prolong it yeah. mm. uh, so i'm going to chip in in here and it relates something a, a little bit to what tim said uh, earlier about um you know problems with uh, you know, fine details hairs um by, uh, <clears throat> the type of microscope, the type of lens you're using makes a um, real uh, difference. Now, some people put um, uh, use the adapters to use the uh, microscope objective lenses uh, on the end of their camera rig. And there you're ending up with the subject very, very close to the lens. So perspective change is an incredible problem um, uh, there. If you're using a, a dissecting microscope, um, my, my microscope is, it is, is a biological stroke dissecting microscope. And I think its working distance is about 165 millimeters. So when you're doing the stack focus, there's a very, because you're starting off from so far away, the perspective change as you're going close is very, very small. So, you, uh, those of you who have a good dissecting microscope, it's actually also a really good type of microscope to use to take this sort of photography. If you're using a um, compound microscope, then typically your lens is, you know, you're, you're going to be very close to the topic and if you, uh, the subject. And when you do your stack focus, perspective can be a bit of a problem. Now on my microscope over here, I've got actually quite a low power lens, which has got a, a very, very long working distance. So it's a very funny lens. It almost works like a biological microscope, but it is absolutely superb for taking stack focus for exactly the same reason. So I can get some quite nice pictures of the hairs on the spider's legs because it's a high resolution camera, taking it from a reasonable distance away. And when I scroll through the, you know, the, the full depth of the spider's leg plus the hairs, um, the perspective change is very small. So I end up with, with quite a good um, photo. Um, uh, I, that's I what hope. I hope we're not scaring people off with with too much technical uh, stuff, but um, I, I think you um, that it, it it's a decision that everyone needs to make for themselves. Yeah. It's a question of whether you need the minimum uh, information from the specimen to make an ID, mm. or whether you're more concerned with producing a beautiful image. Um, and, I, and I suppose people feel differently about about you know what what is needed. Uh, I, I think I would just emphasize something that Paul just said for something like hairs and bristles, you might do a lot better with a compound microscope than you do with uh, a stereo microscope, uh, Tim. Mm. <laughs> I wonder if we've zoned Tim out there. No, no, he's smiling <laughs> quietly. Thinking, I've got to buy a new microscope now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 go and explain that to your wife. Yeah, yeah. I need a new microscope. This, this, yeah. this we should point out to people is a hazard of microscope club. The desire to buy a new microscope after you've heard somebody describe something. <laughs> uh, yeah, but to be absolutely fair, these days the quality of optics is such that even uh, 
a good quality, low end entry level microscope, uh, they're so good. They're such good value for money. And you can, they're, they're way better than you would expect. It's just like good quality, low end binoculars. I mean, like the, uh, the RSPB puffin binoculars for kids. I think they're about 50 or 60 quid and they're amazing quality. You know, uh, way better than what we had, you know, 20 years ago. And my, it's the same with the microscope. My, my compound microscope was 120 quid and it's absolutely superb um, for, you know, producing fine details. You can't, can't put a whole moth underneath it, but, um, you know, for, for very small stuff, it, it, it's fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the point being is that, um, uh, yes, you, you can go a little bit bonkers, just like you can with your bird watching and your photography kit. But these days, the entry level stuff is remarkably good. Um, so much so that it's anybody thinking probably better to start off with entry level kit and then sell it on, then dive in and buy something that wasn't quite what you wanted or or, or you would expect. And again, that was one of the beautiful things when we were able to meet uh, physically at the volunteer training center. That was, you know, you could peer down the different microscopes and get a feel for, for what they would actually um, give you as well. So I'm, whatever happens, I'm sure at some point in the future, we will be able to at least um, do that. And I know speaking to one of the suppliers, he'd said, you know, when we we meet again he'd be prepared to come over with you know some kit and let people have uh, what a, what would probably be a try before you buy you know yeah just having a look at um stuff because there'd be enough interested people there to uh, to, to have a look good stuff but, uh, yeah it's good stuff i have to say the microscope gives me so much pleasure because i can work from home um uh, looking at stuff and uh, learning stuff and I can pick it up and put it down so quickly. I, uh, I, I, prob copy. I probably couldn't have survived lockdown without my microscope, so I have to say. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, should the government hand out microscopes? Then? Yeah, yeah, I think, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, definitely. We have the seed of an idea. Um, uh, OK, yeah. folks, so I don't know if anyone's got anything else they want to ask or raise. Just, okay, just, so sorry, Alan. Yeah. I just wanted to do a quick introduction to myself. I don't know whether. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was a, a bit late coming onto the call. But uh, for those that don't know me, I've just taken over as the new species and recording officer at Rutland Water. I've come from spending fifteen years at Attenborough Nature Reserve, working for Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust. So obviously, I'm a keen entomologist. So microscopy again has been my saviour through lockdown. Uh, but I've got lots of plans for when we can welcome volunteers back to the VTC again at Rutland um, to do some surveys. Aquatic invertebrates is something that really interests me. So watch the space. We, we've been discussing the return of volunteers to the VTC and it, we're not far off. So um, keep yourselves busy for the time being. And then hopefully for the summer, we'll have some really good projects to get involved in and can get the microscopes all up and running again. Fabulous. That, that's something really something to look forward to. Although, uh, um, as, as Paul said, we look we look forward to meeting you in person, Tim. Indeed, but yeah. Well, likewise, yeah. As, as as Paul said, I think there may be some virtue in keeping some of these online sessions running as uh, as well. Uh, we'll have to work out some way of doing some sort of mixture, I guess. Mm. I think it would be a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, folks, so I'm just going to finish it there. Thanks to Paul. Uh, and uh, don't forget uh, next month, uh, Pete talking about uh, multi sections. So thanks, everyone.